From the water protectors, we are reclaiming a narrative of this is stolen land. And when you oppress us with, with thanksgiving and arrest people for trespassing on their own land, we are pointing out that irony. We are making the story whole again. So here we see Indian country in 19, 1834, which is the red part, is still all the Lakota land. Um, when you look at the yellow, it's uh, originally the Sioux Nation covered over almost seven uh, states. What you see there is the, the, the fading lines, the disappearing. A lot of that is breaking of treaties. The treaties were made between two nations, between the US and um, the Sioux Nation, and they've been stolen. And even the US Supreme Court has, has found in 1980 that it was illegal to, to break those treaties. And they had to pay $106 million dollars for the land, but the Sioux Nation said, no, we're not going to take your money because that, that land is not for sale, and if we take your money, we will have essentially sold our land that was never for sale. So now it's in the, the bank account, and I think already in 2003, that was $1.3 billion, but they haven't taken it out because they still say this land is not for sale. It is our land, our ancestors are buried there. It is sacred land, and you're not getting it. So what treaty have the Sioux made with the white man that we have broken? Not one. What treaty have the white man ever made with us that they have kept? Not one. This is the words of uh, Sitting Bull, uh, one of the most famous Lakota Sioux uh, leaders. Uh, he was killed by uh, white settlers as he was uh, waving a white flag hoping to uh, engage in a diplomatic meeting. This actually happens a lot. If you, if you read the histories um, of, of Native Americans in India, and bury my heart at Wounded Knee, or an indigenous people's uh, history of the United States, you'll find over and over, there was so much contact between uh, Indian nations and the white men. That there's a rich tradition of diplomacy, of talking. But every once in a while, you know, there will be a meeting and the white people just opened fire. <laughs> and there's just no way of um, knowing these things. So um, I'm getting to an end here, but this is one thing that got me in tears. After this, I, I think in my introduction, I really focused on the military nature of, of what this uh, country is, because we still see that very rapidly today. The US has over uh, half of its budget is in military still aims to dominate uh, the entire world because it's kind of bloodly stated in its, in its military mission for 2020. Uh, but this is uh, uh, the veterans that actually made the stand at Standing Rock. 3,000 people uh, showed up at the moment when it was needed most because they were threatening in, to come in and evict people and to, to form a human shield. They came unarmed but prepared, so they brought gas masks and they brought medic stuff and they brought, you know, like this is gonna get ugly. We're prepared to be the physical barrier between these prayerful, beautiful, rightfully, yeah, land stewards. Uh, and this is a, a, a video, I'm gonna look at Fabian to open it. We fought you. We took your land. We signed treaties that we broke. We stole minerals from your sacred hills. We blasted the faces of our cousins onto your sacred mountain. And we took still more land. And then we took your children. And then we took, tried to take your language. And we tried to eliminate your language that God gave you and that the Creator gave you. We didn't respect you. We polluted your earth. We hurt you in so many ways. And we come to say that we are sorry. We are at your service. And we thank you.
yourself. We are a fertile fallen nation. We were a nation, and we're still a nation. We have a language to speak. We have preserved the caretakers of the hemisphere. We do not own the land, the land owned us. to follow that because that just opens my heart and I think it really shows that this struggle when they say water is life and this is a struggle for water it is a struggle for life it's a struggle for peace um, it's a struggle for reconciliation and when you look at veterans that have been abused by the system and have also committed violent crimes are stepping up to protect the most peaceful um, uh, citizens of the continent. Um, that is a huge healing uh, process in progress. I'm gonna read this slide. The settlers' work is to make even dreams of liberty impossible for the natives. The natives' work is to imagine all possible methods for destroying the settlers. Frank Fanon. On the other hand, I put a quote from Marx, the alienation of human labor is connected to the alienation of human beings from nature. Uh, I see here in this struggle, a huge struggle of healing. Uh, a struggle that goes beyond dualism and in which also a, a long lasting divide in, in activist branches between idealism and materialism, where in idealism, there's this idea that an idea creates the world, so only if we waste consciousness, things will be okay. Whereas in materialism, which is more the foundation of uh, socialism, or at least Marxism, uh, there's an understanding that as long as you have physical oppression, you have to deal with the physical oppression, and, and changing that infrastructure will enable liberty and freedom and an equal society. Well, I find this very interesting for a discussion where in indigenous struggle, I find actually a reconciliation that moves to me beyond this, <laughs> uh, which is both very material and recognizes material reality and very um, uh, spiritual. I wouldn't say uh, idealist, but spiritual. Um, and. Uh, I, I feel it can do a lot of healing work. So the final challenge is uniting the fragmented, and this has to do with soul work, also not having illusions that just because the indigenous nations are the ones that are putting themselves out as caretakers, as protectors of biodiversity, of actually as great leaders, it doesn't mean that they didn't suffer from all this abuse and fragmentation, that there are serious problems in the communities communities such as alcoholic, uh, problems such as alcoholism, it was the only way to deal with trauma. Uh, you were not allowed to be angry, you were not allowed to do this or to do that. The only thing that you were allowed was to destroy yourself. So there's a escape valve for all this oppression and that's self-sabotage. And I think if you look at the, the Sioux Nation, the average income of a person is $8,000 a year. The life expectancy is for a man 48 and for a woman 52. But if you look at this picture, also the Native nations in their Indian clothes, there have been more Native nation people serving in uh, the US Army, which is so fucked up. <laughs> um, but this is like a Stockholm Syndrome that we, we find in many oppressed uh, people is that, you know, the, the escape valve of surviving an oppression is to become part of that oppression. In the challenge four, I think it's to see that this spiritual leadership, this rising, isn't just something that they have to offer us, but that they're co-creating with us, that 300 nations, native nations showed up as standing rock. It wasn't just because they also had pipelines in their backyard, they also had been uh, dispossessed, they also had this, that, and the other. It's also
also because they're all hungry for a peace, a peace that uh, comes from a deep sense from within. And we talk about prophecies. Uh, in this case, there's been a prophecy about a black snake and fighting the black snake, which in this um, uh, narrative is the pipeline. But I think this prophecy is also really an invitation for looking at the healing work that needs to be done when we talk about social justice, when we talk about having the courage and the compassion to stand up for what is right, it is also listening to your phone. <laughs> Why aren't you here? You're late. <laughs> yeah, it's a wake up call for justice. I, I just put in one slide a little bit of the things that are involved in the struggle. Um, I, I wrote here anti-war, anti-colonialism, anti-police violence, anti-fossil fuel or extractive uh, industries that kill the land base, kill the, the water basins, anti-austerity, inequality, anti-capitalism, uh, grabbing back from land grabs, uh, feminist struggle, water wars, anti-racism, dismantle white supremacy, fighting extreme right and Nazis. And at the middle of all that is world peace. Uh, so, so many times we're accused of only saying what we're against because we're anti-racism or we're anti-this or anti-that. I, I once learned from somebody, it's not being positive or negative. You know, the universe doesn't care about positive and negative. They're equal. It's the emotion you bring to it. And if you're in motion, uh, if you're anti-racist and you're pro-equality, that's the same thing. <laughs> um, so, so it's the passion, and that's actually the passion for, for peace. And I, I think world peace isn't some, uh, some world without conflict, but it's a world that can deal with this conflict without escalating it into nuclear war or other types of disasters. So I think we have a big task of dismantling infrastructure and exploitation and build material and spiritual relationships of equality and healing. And uh, Standing Rock is um, providing us with lots of uh, leaders that stand up with both long lasting histories of um, surviving. And we're all, in the 21st century, if I was given a name for the 21st century, it would be the century for surviving. Because it's like in no uncertain terms, it's kind of game over for humanity. I mean, if you look at the science of climate change and look at a lot of facts. So in what way do we want to survive? I, I think that's really a, a pivotal question that the water protectors kind of pose to us. It's like, what way do we want to stand up for, for, for the, the life we want to live? What is important to us? And I think because they haven't been as alienated from the land as you know, we here in the West, <laughs> the answers are closer at hand. Because if you are the territory and you know what it is like to be well adapted to your environment, you can turn to your land, you can turn to your community and, and have a, um, a dialogue about what it means to, to, to live in peace. Whereas if you've been uprooted and fucked over and isolated into individualism, that becomes a harder task to, to kind of understand where forward is. So, 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 stand the territory with direct action, with fierce conviction to win, not symbolically, but materially, physically and collectively. I think we can unite struggles against oppression and build courage and compassion to love the earth and each other enough to dismantle the infrastructure of exploitation, knowing that we will face military oppression and still build these material and spiritual relationships of equality and healing. With a soft front and a hard back, we can embrace the old saying, let's be kind to each other so we can be dangerous together and resist a dominant culture of war and death and build a strong and resilient peace within our communities and in society infrastructure at large. Together, we win. Um, oh, I need some water. <laughs> um, so I think now I would really, really love to get to know a little bit more 
about what brought you here as a water protector or as a potential water protector. And uh, I'd also really love it if we can talk a little bit about the actions that are already uh, started. The 1st of September, we had an action in front of ING. So yeah, tomorrow there will be an action in front of ING as well. So it would be interesting to talk a little bit about that as well. But um, first, let's open the floor and just see what what thoughts and feelings are out there. We, we, we grieve in, in private, not in public. Um, so uh, for you to also find the compassion and courage to share your feelings uh, is, uh, is very much needed. And thank you for showing your, uh, your strength in vulnerability. So first I'll address the, the basic question of who am I? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Chihiro, I'm a filmmaker. I made a, a movie, Radical Friends, in Bolivia, which is a struggle for rights for Mother Earth. And Bolivia also has a history of water war. In 2000, um, they chased out a privatized uh, uh, water company, Bechtel, uh, from uh, Cochabamba. Um, so, yeah, I would say I've been a climate activist for a long time and for 10 years I've been working with the International Socialists and re this year I've also become a member of the International Socialists. So I come at this struggle from both an activist, filmmaker, indigenous, climate justice, healing, Buddhist perspective. If that's <laughs> so that's for that. Then with people leaving, I'm, I'm not quite sure uh, of the latest updates. I've been following yesterday. I went, oh my God, when I saw uh, late at night that there's been an oil spill in North Dakota uh, happening right now. And I was like, can't keep up with the news. Too much information. But I think one of the things when they, we suffer information overload or, or miss the information, it kind of helps to ground in, in the basic the basic situation, the basic situation, the basic injustice is very kind of easy to understand. And I think with the history, we can also understand that the, the water protectors from the start, they said, this is not the end. You know, when, when the, the easement was given, they, they have faced uh, deception, broken treaties, broken promises, like Sitting Bull also said, like the white men never kept their word, not once. They are not going uh, into this process blind blinded you know they know there will there will be another stab in the back you know that energy transfer has uh, broken the law every step of the way you know when when there wasn't a permit yet they also just already started building and said we will keep on building and obama had just said like this is not allowed that is not allowed and, yeah we will keep on building and government will give us this and government will give us that it's like wait a second your energy transfer you're telling what the government is going to do that's fucked up <laughs> So, um, yeah, people leaving blizzard. I think uh, there's a really, really nice rant from the Young Turks about Governor Dapple when uh, he has just made lie after lie after lie at a press conference about, yeah, we're clearing the road, we've plowed the roads, and, and we're going in for their protection, and it's just lie after lie. And he has this rant, and he's talking about, this is Trump's America, a post-factual America, where facts don't matter. Just repeat a lie, 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 and corporate media will just copy-paste. And that's how it works. And I think that's a, a pretty um, important thing. I don't think it's a new thing. Uh, whenever people are sh in shock about Trump, I, I kind of, uh, I mean, yeah, it's really a, a shitty deal. <laughs> and this, is, this really means a lot of struggle. And it's, it's, it's an attack on, on every social justice movement out there. Um, but it's, it's not exactly a break from America. It's, it's a superlative of America. It's a, a America without a mask, so to speak. So um, moving on to Trump, how could this happen if there were treaties? Well, all along there are a lot of legal fictions. <laughs> um, there's there's a um, this idea that you know you can't break the law, but it, I think we should recognize that capitalism kind of functions by violence from top down is always normalized, and violence from up from down up is criminalized. So if, if, if they're violating of the law, 
and you're up <laughs> above the law. <laughs> it, it, it continuously happens. And um, I think it's very interesting. I, I love law and I love people fighting for law. I made a whole movie about law for, for rights for Mother Earth because the law is kind of like the ultimate narrative of a nation, you know, like what is right and wrong or what is criminal and what is not criminal. But it also says like in the United States, there, there's a lot of um, struggles with people from Alaska that bring forth some things, but the law says, the original people from Alaska don't have any rights. Or in, in, in Canada, there's a lot of people that are not Canadian citizens because they are born on Indian land and they're not, uh, they don't have civil rights because they're not Canadian. They are their own nation and they, they have their own governments and everything. But I think we should understand from the get-go that laws are not obeyed when, when, uh, when it comes to these things. Even though, like even the US Supreme Court has found that the U.S. <laughs> was wrong in taking this land, this treaty land. I want to get that belief is, is defending an unlawful thing, actively, you know, that, that I get what you're saying, but mm. this is kind of a next level thing, you know, to me at least. Well, it's, it's a next level thing in, in, in bringing that out in the public, but I think anybody who's been at a uh, G8 top or anybody who's been at a, a climate summit or anybody who's been at a, a big Black Lives Matter manifestation or anybody has put themselves on the line for social justice kind of knows that the police don't operate by <laughs> um, uh, lawful methods. They just change the law. It's like, oh, now we'll put a ban on demonstrations. Never mind that putting a ban on demonstration is putting a ban on democracy we'll just spin that in some other way in the media because the media will just copy. Um, so yeah, I, I think we should not in any shape or form be naive about the, the length of lies and the length of breaking the law by power that is occurring on a daily basis. I mean, every day two environmental defenders are being killed. Is that lawful? No. Are they being... Uh, one of the things of having a lot of female uh, indigenous leaders in this movement is that with every pipeline, and North Dakota is filled with pipelines and pipeline projects on, uh, on and around native territory, with every pipeline there is a, a rampant amount of rape. And one of the reasons is that white men are not getting sentenced in Indian land because in Indian land there are laws, there are governments, but the governments, just because of uh, power relationships, have a really difficult time in trying a white man. So basically, you can get away with uh, rape and murder. You have a lot of man camps at these pipeline uh, situations. A lot of, you know, macho. Um, they're already raping the earth. Uh, why not rape a woman? Um, these are really, really awful statistics uh, of, of rape and disappearing women. Uh, sometimes girls as young as four years old. Um, so the, another reason why a lot of women are standing up is that this is a, this is a female fight for female bodies, female, female sovereignty, and uh, a continuous rape politics that disregards any any laws. This is like waking up to the 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 physical side of capitalism. I mean, you have the the, the structure side of capitalism, which is banks and, and, and money streams and everything. But there's the physical side of of raping the earth. Of and that's I think in climate justice activism you really see that when you go to the, the coal mine fields and you see just Mordor landscape, you see what it does, what 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 fuels this constant destruction. It's it's growth, 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 expansion of empire at the expense of other communities that are being sacrificed. Oil doesn't rain down from the sky. It's deep within the earth. If you want to get it out, you have to rip open the earth. And if, you, if you're that committed to ripping open the earth, you're, you are willing to rip out the communities and everything that lives on it, whether it's people or wolves or owls or whatever. It's, it's yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't have any faith in law-abiding uh, uh, powers. Um, I think really we are we are our own hope, and, and, and building a little bit on that hope uh, hope narrative is that um, what what? 
I'm kind of naive. Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> I know what you want to do. The hope narrative is actually I want to. Um, I have here some really awesome. We know about the veterans showing up. We know about um, uh, 300 nations showing up. We know about um, solidarity actions happening in Tokyo, in Nor uh, Nor uh, Norway. There's already been uh, a bank that uh, pulled out their. Um, their that they, they broke their contract, like with the, the, the financing. Um, but there are a couple of uh, direct actions that I, I didn't hear about as much, and I would kind of... Let's save them for the end. Okay. I want to give some more room. Okay. I'm, I'm very happy and honored to um, gather in this, in, this, in this theme, because I think really, truly, from the bottom of my heart, it has such healing potential for us all. Um, and I see there's, oh, no, it's not a timer. I thought there was a timer. <laughs> no, no, I'm, reco <laughs> I'm recording. No. So, uh oh. But okay. you have two minutes and 42 seconds left. So. Oh. Um, and I don't want to spend it all on Trump, but I will get to it. So the first thing I would like to say, this is also from the indigenous history of the United States. The first population forcibly organized under the profit motive, whose labor was exploited well before overseas exploitation was possible, was the European peasantry. Once forced off their land, they had nothing to eat and nothing to sell but their labor. Um, so um, I, I love that the, this book, even though it's about the Uni uh, United States and the uh, indigenous cultures there, it starts with that recognition of before outward expansion started, inward uh, erosion took place, and 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 the fact that you know, uh, I was talking to one of the water protectors from the Netherlands, and she said, you know, we are missing our indigenous ancestors too because they're gone. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, as as much as you know, the the white man has done so much crap, and is still continuing to do so today. Um, um, a lot of white men need healing from missing their, their ancestor, their roots, and they've been uprooted as well. Um, so I wanted to say that. Then I want to shortly address uh, Trump. Um, Fabian, uh, can I just share a little, little uh, moment of the video of Trump? Shows why I think that even though we're here celebrating a victory, you we have a big fight ahead of us. Huh? You're going to get us down right at the <laughs> end? <laughs> It's, uh, so what we're looking here is an interview with a lady, um, an interview with Trump, uh, a, a lady from Miami, who uh, in Miami they they've lifted the roads because you know you know I don't know if you know that song, Dear Miami, you're the first to go, disappearing under melting snow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a Rose and Murphy song. Uh, but yeah, this is actually happening already in in Miami. Like they have to uplift the streets because they're they're fading into the ocean. And uh, she's saying like, hey, did we waste our money on on lifting the street? You're denying climate change still. You know, like Trump is is putting people into the government that are like gonna gut NASA and are are, are horrific. I'm not gonna show the whole clip, but. Uh, where the city has just spent millions of dollars to lift the roads and the sidewalks to raise them because of the rising sea levels. Uh, you've called climate change a hoax. I'm wondering if you think as a builder and someone who knows infrastructure, is, does, did Miami Beach waste its money? Well, I'm not a big believer in man-made climate change. It could be some impact, but I don't believe it's uh, a devastating impact. Uh, I am a huge believer in clean water, and clean air, crystal clean water and air. I'm a very big believer in that, and we have a lot to do with that, keeping our water clean, keeping our air clean. Um, but no, I would say that uh, it goes up, it goes down. I think it's very much like this over the years. Uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, we'll see what happens. Maybe you and I, even you, as young as you are, you won't be around to see. But uh, certainly climate has changed, but the you know, they used to call it global warming. Uh, they've had many different, uh, they call it extreme weather. They always change the name to encapsulate everything. The problem we have is our businesses are suffering. Our businesses are unable to compete in this country because other countries aren't being forced to do what our businesses are being forced to do. 
and it makes us non-competitive, okay, which is something that yeah. 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 puts us at a great economic okay, disadvantage. Okay, we're getting so much wisdom, and now... And you mean, no, I, I wanted to, to, um, to be very clear on this point. Um, not only is resistance more necessary than ever and, and uniting forces, but we are dealing with somebody who is completely... Uh, arrogantly enough to say to state things he's been in court cases uh, when he uh, eroded landscapes in Scotland to build golf golf courses and he will come into a court case and will just say uh, he is the expert he is the evidence and everybody just needs to listen because he is the sitting evidence and he has a, a billion empire a billion dollar empire and it's completely post-factual. Whatever it is, he will say, it. this is really important because it's important and I really believe that this is this and it's crazy. Um, so um, with the resistance we've already been seeing uh, on the street and uh, some of the initiatives that I've seen of uh, a billion women march against Trump, I think this is really in line with everything that's been happening with the, the water protectors. I've, I've seen this is also breaking the narrative of some of the Trump voters that voted for Trump because they think he's angry and anti-establishment. I've seen a, a, a slogger online that said, we need to be behind the water protectors. It's so crazy that with Obama, he's just letting this happen. When we have Trump, he will get angry at us. <laughs> ah. But I've seen even Trump voters like getting on board of the water protectors. Um, there are people who have left their jobs to come, white people that have left their jobs to come to the camp. There are white people that have left their relationships to come to the camp. There are people from um, other states that have sent entire houses. Uh, 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 crowdfunding campaigns that started with 5K goals have already raised over a million. The veterans have uh, 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 raised half a million in two weeks. In total, there have been over $3 million raised by the 99%. Um, so I, I see there's uh, um, America. I, I had a, two American ex-boyfriends, and um, with both of them I've had a fight that, you know, America will not know peace until it's had its civil war because it needs to come clean with what it is. Uh, it, it is a settler colony and it needs to be liberated, and I'm not kind of in the illusion that that liberation will be without a fight. So, uh, what, yeah, what I think that will happen is an uh, intensification of uh, struggle, and I hope that comes with a lot of unification of different areas from the Latin X move, uh, movement, from the Black Lives Matter movement, from anti-austerity, uh, from feminist movement, just to name a few, and quite importantly from the environmental movement, who uh, does have a, uh, even though that they're very uh, uh, white privileged, they use that white privilege a lot of the time to do direct action <laughs> and getting bodies on the line. And I, I want to finish with some uh, some powerful things that we haven't heard so much about is in Dalex, Texas, the headquarters of Energy Transfer Partners in a bold uh, nighttime action, anti-colonialist action billionaires. No, wait. <laughs> this is a movement or an action group called Anti-Colonialist Against Billionaires. I like the name. Uh, locked the building's parking garage door shut with U-locks and left a banner saying, Kelsey Warren is an asshole. Solidarity, <laughs> <laughs> Solidarity with the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, no dapple. In Philadelphia, the city's No Dapple Solidarity organizers put together a tour of shame that marched hundreds through the streets and shut down at least five PD security branches with nonviolent direct action. Shut it down. In Vermont, over 50 people occupied a, a Mitchell's construction site building another pipeline locally. In Pittsburgh, more than 100 people shut down Liberty Avenue, a major thoroughfare in front of the offices of the Army Corps of Engineers during a business afternoon rush hour. And here in the Netherlands, uh, our, our, the person who uh, did the, the, the communication for tomorrow's action in front of ING, she talked to the, the, the people from the office from ING, and the secretary's like, oh my god, I'm getting so many calls. Oh, I can, you know, like she's getting flooded by calls from America. Uh, and we were immediately like, what, what, from America? Why not from Holland? We need to take some serious action, you guys. I mean, and we immediately started talking about like, it's so important that if you 
still with ING, if you're with ABN and you're going to move banks to Triodos or ASN or some other bank uh, that has it shit together at least a little bit better, um, then it's so important that you don't just do this as an individual, but find two or three friends or even one friend and go into the office and really close your account and, and express like, you know, you guys are, are killing the earth with your money. You know, you, you've got it in pipelines and in nuclear weapons. And um, so, so to do it collectively. So I think two, two lessons now is do it collectively, don't do it alone. And um, I think one thing that has been very liberating, that has a huge pool, that there were thousands and thousands, like, we don't even know, like, we see some of the drone videos, and you see the, the, the whole encampment. Uh, at some point, there were 15,000 people in direct action there. Play to win, not symbolic wins, but real wins, and know that that is going to take commitment for a longer time. This is not... This is not a fight for, this is not a campaign. <laughs> this is a commitment to building world peace and, and dealing with the assholes in office. I think that's as, that's, that's as unromantic but as good as it gets. <laughs> <laughs>